The 3rd of August, 2021, we'll call the study session of the Young City Council to order. Uh, we'll start with our roll call taken by City Clerk, Kathy Linnemeyer. Councilmember James Blair. Councilmember Molly Carmody. Here. Councilmember E.J. Curry. Here. Councilmember Holly Smith. Here. Councilmember Tracy Wood. Councilmember Joe DePinto. Here. Councilmember Terry Kaminsky. Here. Mayor J. W. Foster. Also here. Uh, thank you. As I said, uh, Tracy called in and said that he'll try to uh, log in in a little while. He's having an issue that he needs to deal with. Um, you'll also notice people who are tuning in that we are still in uh, hybrid mode. We have Council Member Curry and myself in uh, Council Chambers along with some staff. And uh, we will also, we have, the rest of you are all on Zoom. And this would be on our YouTube later. So we're going to just launch right in. Um, as we get to certain elements on the agenda for tonight, we'll update you on, uh, on those things. We're going to start off first with our very own Michael Malik, who's going to give us a Parks Advisory Committee update. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. As a staff liaison to the Parks Advisory Committee, I come to you today to present the committee's request to utilize a portion of the recently acquired land for the WRF Access Road as a future site of an off-leash City of Young dog park. Not only has this project been an action item on the Parks Advisory Committee annual agenda and parks plan for multiple years, but it is, it is a highly requested amenity within the community. On June 22nd, City of Young Project Manager Patrick Hughes presented Council with the professional service agreements and scope of work outlined from Skillings Incorporated. This included site grading, restroom, security fencing, landscaping, and utility services that would accommodate both the new access road and the recommended dog park. Our committee would hope that you consider our request and move to dedicate a section of this land to this project. Joe? Thank you. Right. Thanks. Um, I, I like the project. I think it's great. Um, my only question was, I, I know we were starting to work with the St. Martin's group. Um, there, I think it was a senior class or something like that. Is that still going on with the design work or did we just switch gears? I believe that was for a different project. We would have to talk to Cody about that, but I believe that was for a different project. Fair enough. Thank you very much then. Any other questions for Michael? We want to convey back to the Parks Committee our appreciation for the continued work and forging the, the plans that make our community a better place to live for everybody. So please thank them for us. And we look forward to this new project moving forward. Awesome. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Cody, I forgot to ask, what time did you want to do your thing with Sarah? In a little bit. Give me a second. Okay. We'll wait. Uh, then uh, Assistant Chief Rob Carlson will bring us up to date on the ATV ordinance. Rob? Council, Mayor, thank you. This ordinance is a wheeled all-terrain vehicle ordinance, aka wheeled or WATV ordinance. Um, in 2013, Washington State legislation passed House Bill 1632. It's allowing cities and counties to regulate the operation of non-highway vehicles on the streets, roads, and highways. Our current code does not specifically address the use of WATVs anywhere in the city limits. Uh, Tonino, Eatonville, and Thurston County do have ordinance allowing operation within their jurisdiction. And I think to be consistent um, with our surrounding agencies, um, I think it would be important for us to look at this and possibly adopt this as an ordinance for the city. Council Member Carmody. Yeah, have we ever have we actually had any um, citizens requesting this? I think that not to me personally, but there has been folks inquiring about it, and I know that uh, 
my time on patrol, I've, I've stopped a few people that have had their WATVs working in the city. They were registered within the state, but they were educated on the fact that they could not operate that within the city limits. Um, and I think that's where the confusion comes into play. Um, folks in the county come into the city and they don't understand that that's just because they get a registration within the state doesn't mean that they can just operate within the city limits of Yelm. Okay, thanks. Actually, uh, Molly, a young man in the community, Chase, uh, came to me a couple of months ago with this very question, and he pointed out to me that our ordinance was not in, uh, was not jiving with the counties and other communities nearby. So I took it to Chief Stansel, who did the research and said, well, what do you know? And uh, that's what we brought forward down to the Public Safety Committee and you all to try to align us with these other ordinances. Uh, so people don't have to guess which kind of, which city line they're crossing and which ordinance they have to follow. Councilmember Blair. I was just going to say I had two or three people talking to me about it before this came up too. There you go. So nice to be able to respond to uh, requests from the community. Uh, does council have any issues with this as it's been presented or could we uh, expect to bring this forward as an action item at the next council meeting? All right, so Rob, if you'll go ahead, um, we'll, we'll get this scheduled for the next or the next council meeting for them to uh, consider action on. Perfect, we'll do, thank you. Thanks for your work on that. Yeah. Okay, we are going to interrupt this agenda for an important anoint announcement from Public Services Director Cody Colt. Cody. Thank you, Mayor Foster. Um, Sarah, if you're on, can you turn on your camera? I've been told there she is. So you might recognize that chair. It's similar to mine, but it's pink instead of blue. Um, this is uh, Sarah Williams. She's our new assistant planner. Um, she started on Monday. We're excited to have her, but as customary, we brought her to a council meeting, at least virtually, so you guys could meet her and just we're, um, learn a little bit about her. We're just excited. She's coming to us from Pennsylvania. Am I correct in that, Sarah, right? Ohio slash Pennsylvania, both. <laughs> yeah, Ohio slash Pennsylvania, um, home of the Liberty Bell. So we're excited to have her and all the knowledge of history she will share with us and just her go-getter attitude. So. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to meet all of you and I'm so excited for today. <laughs> it was really nice to see that that cubicle occupied today, Sarah. <laughs> was it? Well, I haven't decorated it yet, so I have to make some big decisions, I guess, on just that alone right now. <laughs> well, you've already passed your first test in that instead of bringing Pennsylvania chocolate or whatever Ohio offers, you brought the best apple pie I've had in a long time. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, thank right. you. <laughs> we hope to plan on more of those in the future. <laughs> wow. Cool. All right. All right. Thank you for checking in, Sarah. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Cody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Michael Graham now uh, to give us, uh, or Molly, uh, whomever would like to address the fireworks. Ordinance. This was put on the agenda at Molly's request, uh, but as of you know, late, the council took uh, some action. Molly's saying no, it's not, but that's what we understood. So anyway, would anybody like to talk about next steps uh, that the council might consider doing relative to fireworks? Michael? Yeah, I think I think just as as background, uh, I sent out. There was a lot of concern about fireworks. I sent an email to all the council basically informing folks what the restrictions are and why you can't just start banning fireworks, the one year prohibition, uh, what the RCWs say, um, as well as what the Yale Municipal Code says um, when fireworks are allowed. And uh, there, was a, there was a request that said, hey, could you come and put this on a study session and explain this to everybody? We did that. That also preceded the conversations that you've since been having about putting forth a advisory vote, which you've recently done about whether or not to ban fireworks and get that feedback from the community. So I'd be glad to talk uh, about fireworks if you would like to, I'm prepared to do that. Um, or we could also wait and see what the public says after the advisory vote and you could continue the conversation at that point. So let me know how I can help.
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions from council on this, and it's probably because of the action uh, you took on uh, Monday. Uh, so the expectation is then after the general election in November, see what the voters say, and then the council could take steps um, to implement the will of the people or the will of the council, uh, which would then take effect in 2023. So we'll move on. Uh, no hands. And this is moving well along quite nicely because um, some late breaking news about the American Rescue Plan funding mechanisms. Michael's been doing an incredible job communicating with our partners at the uh, federal level and uh, state commerce level. And we have some, some new information come to light uh, regarding how we can best take advantage of those monies. Uh, and so we intend to bring this to you um, did we set a date for that, Michael? As soon as we hear back from the yeah. We have one question left to be answered from uh, them, and we're going to bring you some uh, information back, probably in the form of an executive session prior to an upcoming meeting. So stand by for that. And uh, it's looking really awesome, um, ability to use those monies to benefit Yelm. And so, Casey, I know you were expecting us to talk longer um, about that, but with... Uh, no further ado, if you're ready, could you update us on the uh, on plan? Yeah, certainly. I did see a hand up from James Blair that was put down. I didn't know if you wanted. James, did you have something to add before we start with Casey? Um, I would just regarding that rescue plan money. I just I think we should be a little cautious about that personally um i don't know where everyone else is but i think we've added on enough debt in this country i don't really feel like taking part in it and adding any more well that's why we don't have any information to give you exactly tonight but you're um, when we present you with the information that we have the council will be engaging in a discussion on all of those things including participation in the program and how those monies could or could not be spent so we'll look forward to that discussion at a later date. So Casey, you want to fire it up? I would love to. Can everyone hear me, see me, see my screen? Yes, yes. OK. I am Casey Mock, the assistant planner, one of the two. And tonight I'll be talking about our 2021 comprehensive plan and development code updates that our planning commission has been working so diligently on. So first I'm just gonna go through the docket. Um, it's a pretty short PowerPoint and then I'll go through some questions at the end. So the requests that came in this year, um, we do annual code updates are to allow drive-through establishments in the central business district zone increase the density in commercial zones in mixed use developments, allow chain link fencing, um, review the regulations for RV and mini storage, waive fees for nonprofit housing, review regulations for tiny homes, and we had a rezone request to rezone several properties in our industrial zone to moderate density residential. So the first request was to allow a pharmacy Casey, do you mind if we interrupt with questions as you go? Please do. Hey, Council Member Depeno. Sorry. Um, Casey, could you go back one slide? I was wondering if you could talk about the um, waiving fees for nonprofit housing, um, just how that came about or what the, who's that for yeah. or what that's for? Yeah, so I will go into a little more detail on each one, um, but I can tell you that we were asked to look into this, um, I believe by council. Um, and it, the re request of it wasn't very specific in terms of, you know, which fees are we looking at? Um, and that's something I'll get into when we get further in the PowerPoint. And then I think I'll be able to answer your question a little more fully. So, sounds good, thank you. Yep. Okay, so the first request was to allow pharmacies to have drive-through windows in the central business district. Currently, our code prohibits any drive-through establishments in the central business district. However, they are allowed in other commercial zones. 
the planning commission came to the consensus that non-food serving drive-through establishments in the central business district should be allowed and drive-through traffic should be restricted to exit onto a street other than Yelm Avenue and First Street. Um, this recommendation was based on the impacts that food serving drive-through establishments have. They generate a much higher number of trips than say banks and pharmacies. Um, and so that was why that regulation came into place. Um, and while individual drive-throughs will be looked at at the time of permit to make sure they have adequate queue space for the incoming traffic, um, we just wanted to keep a tighter regulation on the exiting traffic. And that was how that recommendation came about. The next request is to increase residential, resi residential density in the mixed use developments in the commercial zones. So currently in our commercial zones, we allow mixed use developments, which means a mix of residential and commercial. Um, our current code states that you can have no more than 60% residential in the form of apartments, and you can have up to 16 units per acre. The Planning Commission recommends upping the density allowance to 32 units per acre and having no more than 66.6 .6 residential. This number was reached to allow uh, two up, one down apartment buildings with commercial on the bottom. And we also, our code doesn't currently state how much of the commercial component needs to be constructed prior to the opening of the residential. And so just to clear that up, we'd like to put in um, a statement that talks about having a minimum of 30% of the commercial component constructed prior to the completion of the residential and then infrastructure, meaning roads, parking lots, utilities, um, put in place enough to fill the rest of the commercial component prior to the end of the residential. Council Member Carmody has a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, thanks, Casey. Um, uh, well, first of all, I'm unmuted. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. God, let me close the door. Damn door. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you. I was wondering. So, this is in the regular old commercial zone, not the CBD, right? Correct. Okay. Do we have, I cannot remember, do we have a, a height limit on buildings in commercial zones? We do. I believe it's 35 or 40 feet. Okay. Um, so could, could you, look. could somebody do that? Could somebody put in 32 units per acre with just a three-story building? I mean, it's possible. It's it, tight, it is huh? possible. It could be tight, yeah. I mean, a future recommendation would be that we look further at our building height um, and setbacks to accommodate that growth, but yes, it is possible to do it. Okay, perfect, thanks. So maybe we can stick that somewhere on a, on a sticky note for further review. Certainly. Down the line. Okay, thanks. Yep, I can throw that in my docket. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next request was chain link fencing. Currently our code prohibits chain link fencing when visible from public right of way. Um, there are exceptions for facilities that require chain link fencing by the state. You know, um, Homeland, Homeland Security requires some essential facilities, schools, et cetera. But in general, um, most developments are not allowed to have it. The Planning Commission recommends that chain link fencing is allowed. Um, and then if it's adjacent to the right of way, you are required to have a dense landscape screen, which is defined in our code as a 15 foot width landscape barrier. Or if it's visible, but not adjacent to the right of way, um, you, we would require the standard eight foot perimeter landscaping on the outside of the chain link fence. And we do have a stipulation in here that the landscape requirements may be modified or waived if staff finds that distance would make landscaping unnecessary. The planning commission found that this language was important because if you have you know, empty land and a chain link fence 300 feet away, we need some way to make sure that we're not putting an unnecessary burden on developers. Moving right along, uh, the next request is, was to review design standards for RV and mini storage. 
Currently, RV and mini storage are allowed in our C2 and C3 zones. That would be the heavy commercial and large lot commercial, but they have to be 500 feet from an urban or major arterial. Um, that includes Yelm Avenue, 507, in addition to Bald Hills, Canal, Grove, Stevens Coats Connector. Um, so, you know, a few roads in town. The Planning Commission did not want to change the existing regulations. However, they did want a note put in here that they understand that a future update to our transportation system plan, which is probably coming in the next year, um, could change which streets are classified as arterials. And at that time, it would be appropriate to revisit this standard. Okay, the next request was to consider fee waivers for nonprofit housing. Currently, our fee schedules allows permit fee waivers for nonprofit corporations that are registered with Washington State. Um, the Planning Commission did not recommend to change any existing regulations. They did state that they look favorably on fee waivers, um, but they would want a housing needs analysis completed, which would be something that Council initiates. And this is a formal report that quantifies our current housing stock and needs and projects out to the future. Uh, you know, what housing stock we'll have and what types of um, housing situations we'll need. And the other thing that we did want to mention is our fee schedule is put in by ordinance. And so it is not a code update or a comprehensive plan update that would change that. Um, it would be um, probably something that the finance team would need to look into. And Molly, I see you have your hand up. There we go. So um, on the housing needs analysis uh, or the housing um, a housing plan, I think they mm -hmm. requested a housing plan. Um, and I didn't know exactly what that was. And so I emailed you guys a while ago and then Grant said, well, here's a sample from the city of Olympia. And it was a fantastic document, but my goodness, it was like 120 pages long. So my question is, um, does the planning commission want us to pay for a housing plan to be done? I don't, and how much does a housing plan cost? You know, that's, I mean, it's a great idea, but I know that it's not gonna be cheap. So um, what kind of money are we looking at down the road to do some kind of a housing plan? Yeah, that's a good question. So it would be something that we would need a consultant for and we'd put out an RFP for. Grant, I see you're ready to take this question. Only if you need. Well, I'll put in my two cents. Um, first of all, just to clarify the language, the housing needs analysis is a portion that's contained in the housing um, action plan. So you know, the fee waivers, it's all contained in one document. And just for the benefit of everyone else in this call, a housing action plan is a document that, you know, quantifies our needs and our stock, but it also comes up with very concrete strategies for, you know, what we can change in our code and our comp plan in our permit process. So it's a pretty focused document that gives a lot of, um, a lot of pointed advice. As for cost, Grant, I would love for you to take that. I would, um, we, we don't know until we get the, the RFP back and then start negotiating with the consultant. But what I can say is that, you know, as, as typical for Yelm, we, we build on the work of others and uh, all three of the, our Northern, uh, Northern sister cities have already completed one or in the process of completing one. And ours would be because of our size and the population would be much more focused. So I would not expect it to be nearly as uh, lengthy or expensive as as Olympia's. You know, the, the much larger okay. jurisdiction with a lot more uh, uh, needs, I guess. Of course, yeah. Do you can? Is there any way that you guys can get us some sort of a ballpark number so that we would know what kind of numbers we're talking about, just cost-wise? You know. Yeah, the the recommendation of the planning commission. You know, I think, um, and you've already taken that forward to to propose it as part of the next budget amendment, and as part of that process, we would uh, try to vet out more details so we can put together a budget proposal for you to take a look at. Okay. 
Thank you. And your cat is very cute. Uh, no, he's kind of a jerk, but. <laughs> That's okay. He's still cute. Okay. We only have a couple left. The next request was to review regulations for tiny homes and or other forms of alternative housing. So currently we don't have minimum lot sizes in our residential zones. So nothing on the land use side technically prohibits tiny homes. Although tiny homes struggle to meet the international residential code um, in terms of for various reasons, ceiling height, um, energy code, a few different things. The planning commission recommends that we update our municipal code to incorporate the international residential code appendix Q. And this is just a very short appendix that gives tiny homes um, ways to meet the building code and be up to code. Um, in terms of thinking larger about tiny homes and alternative housing, um, this is something the planning commission, again, would like council to initiate a housing action plan for. Um, they don't feel ready at this point to make any decisions in terms of you know, what they can do to have tiny homes or other forms of alternative housing. Okay, and the last item is a rezone. So the two parcels shown with these blue stars um, requested to have their parcels rezoned from industrial, which is this purple, and into moderate density residential, which is this tan color. Um, and we found that the logical boundary was to include all these 10 parcels outlined in red. Um, this is Northern Pacific Road that borders them on the west. And the Planning Commission recommended the rezoning of these 10 properties east of, oh, I guess that's railway, that's not Northern Pacific, um, from industrial to moderate de density residential after looking at a water and sewer infrastructure analysis in addition to the potential gain or loss of tax revenue. We also held a public hearing um, and received several positive comments from property owners in that rezone that they would support the rezone. And we do still have vacant industrial land left in our city limits. Okay, that is it for me. What questions can I answer? Go ahead, Molly, and then Terry. Sorry. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, yay on the rezoning. And so what do we do next? How can we put this in front of council to vote on it at the next meeting? Or because I think this is the third or fourth time that we've actually looked at this. So it should be familiar to everybody by now. And, and, I, and I, since we've gotten some positive feedback from the citizens, I don't see a problem with moving forward with this at a business meeting. So in terms of adding it to the next council meeting agenda, I haven't taken a look um, at the preliminary agenda items to see if our next meeting's pretty bulky. I think originally we were thinking about bringing all these to council in September, but we could expedite that. Whatever is easiest. I mean, you know, this isn't going to change anybody's life in two weeks, but I'm sure that the residents that are there would like this to have to be done sooner rather than later. So if we can fit it in, that'd be great. Otherwise, you know, if it's too bulky, like you said, let's let's um, put it out to an easier council meeting. So yeah, part, no, we can. Part, part of the sorry, Casey, part of the right. um, reason to bring it, we, we kind of pushed this up so we could bring it to the council uh, at this study session, just to make sure you all are okay with uh, with moving forward. We do have to have a public hearing. So oh. based on based on the, the general consensus that this is uh, should move forward, uh, we will schedule that public hearing at the first available meeting and work back from there. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, Terry, then, then we'll come back. Very good. Let's, go to, let's go to Terry um, first and then Tracy, thank you. Yeah, just on this one, are there only two people that want this to be rezoned to residential and did they say why? No, two people originally put the request in, but we received comments from property owners outside of those two that um, came to our public hearing in support of the rezone. And these are the only two with houses on them, is the rest vacant? 
No, so uh, one of these has a um, wireless communication facility. Most of these are developed residentially. Um, none of them have industrial businesses on them. This bottom one um, is in the floodplain, so I believe that one is undeveloped, but most of them have one single family home on them. Okay, thank you. Um, and if back I can, if I can add on this, this actually was initiated at a council meeting when what the, when the property owner came in uh, concerned that because of the zoning, the VA uh, wouldn't uh, refinance their home. Yeah. Um, and at that point, we put it on the docket so we could move forward and try to try to help that out. Okay, thank you, Grant. Um, back to number one, is it only the pharmacy on the corner that is affected by this one change? No. So this would apply to all non-food drive-throughs in the central business district. That could be banks, pharmacies. But how many, on. Are there, how many are there actually that exist right now in that district? That's a great question. Grant, you want to take a stab? Well, I guess... Uh, I think right now there's only one pharmacy, but this would give the opportunity for other businesses to either locate on vacant property and incorporate a drive-through if they're a non-food service industry, or if a new tenant moved into an existing building and they had an opportunity to, they, they could uh, do the same thing. So I guess it affects the entire central business district. There's one business that we can picture that would benefit uh, potentially immediately. Right. And you said before that we would require a traffic study to approve this. Is that correct? So we require a traffic study in general when a use is expected to generate 25 or more new trips. Um, we do technically have the right to initiate um, environmental review below that threshold if we wanted to, um, but I believe our general standard would be that 25 or more new trips would generate a traffic study. Okay, so that would also include the, uh, the potential commercial rezoning with residential, that, that a lot of it is on our main thoroughfare, and we already have bad traffic, so I'm just asking. Yes, and that's why Planning Commission was very careful that they don't want drive-through traffic exiting onto, you know, one of these main thoroughfares. And part of the review when a drive-through comes in would be that we need to, they need to show that they have adequate quick queuing space so that cars are never backed up into a street. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm asking now about the commercial rezoning for mixed-use residential 32 units. A lot oh. of commercial is on the main road, so you would definitely need a traffic study for that. Oh yeah, these mixed use developments certainly generate enough trips to require environmental review um, the majority of the time. You know, if, if a development project wasn't expected to generate 25 new peak PM trips, it probably wouldn't have a big impact at all. So anything that you know, any mixed use development, anything with three floors, you know, definitely would require a study. So the, so the order is we approve some kind of recode, then the traffic study. And if we don't meet that traffic study, it gets aborted. Is that right? So usually the way that um, it goes is a project, they'll put in their permit application um, and we let them know you meet the threshold for environmental review, which environmental review includes traffic as well as noise, stormwater, you know, traditional environmental factors, um, and pocket gophers. And so traffic would be one part of that where we look at traffic in terms of levels of service, um, which is, you know, the average number of seconds that drivers are delayed at the peak traffic hour. And if a project dropped our projected level in service significantly or dropped it below adopted standards, um, we wouldn't, we would only allow the project with mitigating measures. So for instance, when Walmart came in, you know, they had to build Walmart Boulevard. Um, and so we wouldn't, you know, necessarily deny a project, we would just force them to do mitigation measures. And if they didn't agree to that, that would be when a project dies. 
Okay, thank you. And one more quick question. I'm sorry, but you kind of lost me on the fencing. This mm -hmm. uh, metal fencing or whatever you're calling it, this this is for for what now? For neighborhoods or for, can you review that again quickly? Yep. Which fences are we talking about? So this would be anywhere in the city that wanted to put in chain link fencing. Um, and the planning commission recommends that we now allow chain link fencing as technically right now, we do not allow chain link fencing anywhere in the city. Um, so we would allow it in the city, but with the caveat that, you know, if it's adjacent to the right of way, you need a 15 foot dense landscape screen. If it's visible from the right, right of way, you need an eight foot perimeter landscape, which would be trees, shrubs, et cetera, um, to kind of screen the fence. And do you know why they recommended this change? Is, is it just because the wooden fences are falling down all over the place? Is that why? I think part of the reason that the planning commission felt this way is because chain link fencing can be a cost effective alternative um, for you know keeping a property secure. Some developers may not want to pay for a very expensive fencing option that actually protects their property better than a wooden fence. Um, I think that was part of the reason for the change. And you know, the reason that our code prohibited chain link fencing was due to the aesthetic impact. And planning commission felt that if we could mitigate that negative aesthetic impact, then there's no reason we shouldn't allow so people to put it in. Would cover city lots, like you're in a neighborhood and instead of a wooden fence, you have chain link fences between the houses? I Is mean- to do that? So with residential, you know, neighborhoods and subdivisions, they are required to do perimeter landscaping and we accept wooden perimeter landscaping. I don't see why a developer would ever put a chain link fence in a neighborhood. And if they did, they'd have to construct perimeter landscape all around it. So it would be most favorable and cost effective for them to put in um, a wooden fence. You know, this is really more pointed for um, industrial and commercial uses that wouldn't be putting in a wood fence and they don't want to pay for an option other than. But if you allowed it, then I could tear down my fence and put up a chain link between me and my neighbor. I'd be okay with the city. As long as it was okay with my neighborhood CCNRs. If no. you had perimeter landscape around it, which it's an eight foot wide perimeter landscape. And if it's adjacent to the street, it would be a 15 foot wide perimeter landscape. So it's a pretty hefty, I mean, if someone really felt the need to have chain link fencing, they could with landscaping around it. No, but this is not, not on right of waste. I won't tie up the meeting with this. I just was trying to understand what you're talking about. It, it's fine. Councilmember Wood and Carmody. Um, my curiosity on that last topic is: is when did we, when did the city decide that chain link fencing was not allowed? First question. Grant, were you there, or was it before you? I think that started back in the vision plan. It was part of the vision plan and part of the initial zoning code that was adopted after the vision plan. About 1995, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 26 years ago, we decided chain link fencing shouldn't be allowed, or someone decided that chain link fencing shouldn't be allowed, and the advances in chain link fence technology have leaps and bounds as far as the things that you can, the, the slats, for example, that you can put in all different shapes and colors and sizes. It just seems like an antiquated rule um, that's kind of, I mean, that just, I mean, and I agree, we should allow chain link fencing, but it seems like we're getting a little bit pushy as far as, you know, okay, we'll allow it, but you have to do this, that, and the other thing. It just seems like something, you know, and of course, this is just my, my opinion, but I think we ought to eliminate the rules on this within reason. I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't agree with people putting six foot chain link fence across the fronts of their property along the road, but, uh, you know, if, if people want to put a if, if council member Kaminsky wants to put a six foot chain link fence between her and her neighbor's backyards, I just fail to see where that's an issue with, uh, with the city on any level if, uh, you know, if her, if her HOA is okay with it. 
Um, secondly, I was wanting to talk about the commercial property rezoning. Did we, has it, have we heard any, any negative from anybody as far as whether that's, you know, was there any negative feedback on that? Did anybody have a problem with it at all that we've heard, heard from yet? Um, do you mean the industrial rezone? Correct. This yeah. guy? Yes. So we did not receive any negative public comment at the public hearing. You know, it was advertised on signs around the property to all property owners within 300 feet and in the newspaper on our website. So we got the word out and didn't receive any comments in opposition. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, first I saw James, then his hand went down. Then I saw Joe. And then Terry, then Molly. Tracy hit what I was going to say regarding the fences. So Joe? Thank you. Um, my question is, does moderate density allow for apartments to be built there? Yes. It allows um, a variety of types more than any of the other residential zones. Is that road, um, can that road handle a lot more traffic? Not real. Um, I'm guessing they would exit on, uh, not railroad, but the other one. Northern Pacific. Yeah. Or, or no, not not Northern Pacific. The other one, um, towards the bottom of that screen, the east. Oh. Of it. Right yeah, here. that one and the other side going up. Yeah. So um, part of the uh, review that we did was to look at transportation impacts, and we did find that it could handle it. You know, if all those parcels developed out industrially, it could mean more traffic than if they were built out residentially. And in addition, as these parcels develop, they'll have to do half street frontage improvements, you know, put in sidewalk, street trees, et cetera. So yes, that was one of the things that we looked at. Fair enough, thank you. Terry, then Molly. How was it allowed that a residence was permitted to be built in an industrial zone in the first place? Pre-existing non-conforming use it was allowed under previous code. Back in the day, this was, I believe, zoned agriculture, one unit per five acres. Yeah, it was farmland. Okay. Yeah. And then afterwards, it was zoned industrial. Okay, right. got it. Molly? Yeah, um, yeah my question is uh, still about this rezoning. And so you're saying that you already had the public hearing, and now I'm being told that we need another public hearing? Part of the rules, yes. State law mandates um, public hearing for planning commission and public hearing before city council. Clarification, Casey. I think the confusion is the public hearing was on uh, asking the neighbors about the rezone. This public hearing would be on the adoption of the update to the comp plan. Is that okay. right? Including all of the recommendations that the planning commission has put forth? So the original public hearing was also for all of the recommendations at once. Okay. Just the second one. Hmm. Okay. So why do we have to have two? Why couldn't we have had that one just cover both of them? Any development <clears throat> regulation or the conference of plan has to have a public hearing at the planning commission. And then before adoption and enforcement, the growth management act okay. requires uh, a hearing and action by the city council. So. so one was the planning commission level and this one's council level. Okay, correct, I understand correct. now. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Terry? Um, I can think of several properties on Yelm Avenue that have chain link fencing. So is this not allowed currently? So it, again, I believe that would be pre-existing non-conforming. Some of these, you know, if someone had chain link fencing before and it was damaged, we would allow them to repair it. Usually we wouldn't force them to replace it just if it needed a little repair. So I believe that is the case with a lot of the chain link fencing in the so city. They would have been there before the vision plan grant. Okay, all right, just asking. So Terry, like that big chain link fence on the storage unit there on the corner of Grove Road and, and Yelm Avenue or Highway 510, that was there before the, the code went into effect about the chain link fencing. And in fact, was one of the motivators for the vision plan members and the, comp, and the planning commission at the time to put those rules in place so that you didn't have a big, ugly, gray uh, chain link fence as the beautiful entry to Yelm. That was part of it. I saw a hand fly up. Was that Holly? I was 
just gonna say I do have some chain link fence in my backyard. It's been there since 96. Just saying. You're good. Yeah, the chain link fence that they're talking about is not the residence in between people's yards. They're talking about on the right of way of Yelm. Um, and I think that at least, I mean, I, you know, if somebody wants to put up chain link fencing, that's fine. But I do think that we need to have the landscape screening. I mean, I don't want to look at, I don't want to look at chain link all the way down Yelm Avenue. You know, if, if I think that we require people to at least put in landscape screening, that's fair. Chain link fencing isn't really on the beautification plan. Yeah, it's not very pretty. And that's why they, that's why they, they want to sort of it. put a kibosh on it in the first place. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Casey, did you get to the end of your recommendations? It reading. did. We got them all. Fantastic. Um, before we move on, then I just want to say, wow, AC Mock, thank you, Western Washington University, and your study habits and our hiring practices. That was phenomenal. What you've done here in a very short period of time is nothing short of amazing, and how you've uh, come to understand our rules and applied them uh, in your job. So well done, Casey. And Thank uh, Sarah, you. you set the bar pretty high. <laughs> well, we got confidence in you. She did. I'm very confident that I'll be good. Maybe not as good as Casey, but I'll be good. <laughs> You'll be great. You'll be great. Um, hey, before we let uh, Grant and Casey off, I just want to bring it to all your, your attention, even though he'll punch me in the face later. Uh, this is Grant's last meeting no. with us. Uh, and we just want to it's, honor it's him. My last, his... It's my last meeting as an employee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Grant is taking with him an entire stack of blue cards. He swears he's going to come back and uh, do public <laughs> comment at every meeting. But uh, Grant has, with you know, without a lot of fanfare, and I appreciate Grant's sensitivity to this, but we do owe Grant an enormous debt of gratitude uh, for the work that he's put in uh, for the city of Yelm. He's done it with style, professionalism, uh, usually calm, and uh, and he's been a mentor uh, to mayors <laughs> and council members, and certainly the staff that he's worked with. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Grant, for all of the, the things you've done for us in Yelp. Well, thank you, but um, as I've said before, and, and probably not in front of Sarah, but certainly in front of Casey, I have no concerns with the future of Yelm. You're in good hands, and Landon is just as, just as amazing, and uh, will do well by the city. It's, you're in good hands and have a great team uh, on the planning side, so. And yes, Casey is a rock star. I have a Grant, feeling what's we'll your be... what's oh, your Mark. last day, Grant? Friday. Friday. And aside from the blue cards, I have a feeling we'll be seeing Grant again in some professional capacity. Just a hunch. Mayor, He's don't you think, don't you think we need some kind of hall of fame for the people that have really crafted part of the city, or maybe a statue, something We've important? A, yeah, like a statue in the roundabout. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tracy, thank you for putting your hand up. Your commentary, please. Um, you know, not much of a commentary. I just want to thank Grant for, you know, I've, I've been around a while and uh, he was here long before I got here and uh, has been nothing but a resource this entire time and has made my experience as a city council member uh, uh, extremely less stressful than I think it would be had he not been available at pretty much every turn to answer questions, whether they were legitimate or off the wall crazy ideas that I may have had. Um, and I just, I, I, I just want him to know that, uh, you know, it's much appreciated and it has been a, a big part of it and, and something I'll never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. And long before I was on city council, Grant and Tammy were the only people I knew on the city that worked with me as a, as a broker in real estate, always there to answer questions and help with things. So thank you, Grant. 
you're you're dead to me, Mayor Foster. <laughs> I have achieved my goal. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. You can pay me back later. Um, okay, um, we're going to go on. I don't have any specific report. We've covered a lot of stuff tonight. I know we're all eager to uh, go home and see what the voters of Thurston County feel about the measures on their ballots. Uh, but we do have an opportunity for council member initiatives. We'll start with council member Blair. I've got nothing tonight. Council member Curry. Harmony. Harmony. Um, nothing really, but I do have one question. Um, I know that the, um, the car park place or the car, uh, the, the place that, God, I can't even remember it. It's, it's the car repair place that's on, uh, the corner of first and Yelm Avenue. Car star. Car star. Yeah. They bought that lot that's right across the street from, or across the, the, uh, Yelm, uh, Tonino walkway, the trail path. And they had said that they were going to do something with that for a really long time. And they still haven't done anything with it. And now it's just become a big parking lot. And I'm wondering what's going on there. Um, and you know, I mean, if you want to talk about driving past, not very attractive things in Yelm, that would be one of them. Um, I was under the impression that they were going to do something with that parcel. And the chain link mean, wouldn't fix it. That's right, just put up a chain link fence, Terry. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, thank you for bringing that to the attention. Uh, we've also noted that it is, uh, there, there, We'll get back to you on on that. There's some uh, issues there, but they are complying with existing code right now. Okay. For what Just because I've code. had, I've actually had people comment to me, yep. you know, say, "Hey, this is really not attractive," especially when you're walking, you know, past the, you know, past it on the trail. Yeah. So. Well, we tore down that old red house to make that yeah. lot look better. Now. Okay, thank you, Molly. We'll take that uh, in and we'll bring some okay. feedback. To Actually, you. I, had, I, had one other, I had one other thing. So um, I had, you know, I walk my dogs on the trail a lot and I was walking through City Park and I walked past the little Tonino, Yelm Tonino trailhead, um, that little tiny sort of like, it's not even a pocket park really, that's on First Avenue. And I was wondering, you know, it would be really cool to have some sort of dog drinking fountains along the way. Um, you can get the ones that, you know, are kind of auto filling that have a, that have a, a float, like a toilet, or you can have ones with like, with like a push button, whether a human pushes the button and fills up the water bowl. And, um, you know, that would be really cool. And it's a really cool amenity for people to walk their animals, especially in city park. Um, but I, I talked to Public Works Director Cody Colt, and he said, well, unfortunately, all that water is reclaimed water, so animals aren't allowed to drink out of it. And I said, well, that's kind of a bummer. Who do I talk to? And he said, ecology. So I did. I called, um, re I called resources, and they said, we don't have a problem with you using the reclaimed water of your own because it's your water, we don't need to issue you an extra permit for it. And I said, well, that's great, but can we actually give this water to our pets? And they said, I don't know, you need to talk to water quality. So I went and I talked to water quality and they said, absolutely, you can do this. We don't see a problem with it. Um, and I said, that's great, can I get it in writing? And she said, sure, I'm a little backed up. It's gonna take a couple of weeks, but, um, from what I can tell, ecology has no problem with giving, you know, letting us use the reclaimed water or class A reclaimed water, which is drinkable for humans by any standard, um, and making it, um, you know, using that water for little water fountains for, for pets. So, um, that being said, I'm just kind of waiting for a, you know, an affirmative something in writing from her saying, yeah, we can do this. You know, I mean, there's a, a phone call is, is always a nice thing to have, but it's not in writing. So I'm waiting for something in writing from ecology saying that we can do that. 
And then I'd like for us to start thinking about doing that sort of thing. It ties in with Terry's, um, you know, beautification thing. It'll get more people out on the streets and more people out on the trails, um, out enjoying the day. So hopefully we can move forward for that. That's all I got. Uh, Council Member Curry. I have no takes. Council Member Smith. Uh, nothing tonight. Council Member Wood. I have nothing as well, and I'm not interested in motivating people to go outside any more than they automatically or naturally are motivated to go out and do that. So <laughs> that's all I got. Okay, Council Member DePitto. Uh, to all the candidates out there for tonight on election night for the primary, may the odds be ever in your favor. Council Member Kaminsky. Well, after 50 days of dry weather, it's supposed to rain right on our jazz festival, but I'm going anyway, Friday and Saturday. See you there. No reports. Thank you, Terry. Um, I was meeting with Marion today. Uh, he's concerned about the rain, but we are in the Northwest and people who want to enjoy a good time out uh, in the park and listen to good music and eat good food uh, and drink good beer or Peroni and drink wine uh, will come out and enjoy the festival anyway. So. For the ladies, there will be wine, not just beer. I said that. Thank you, just repeating it. There. Yeah, it's gonna be a great festival as have the last two festivals, the barbecue rally and the mermaid festival were both enjoyed by many, many people in our community and from around the region who came out here to Yelm uh, to enjoy what Yelm has to offer. So, and you can't pass up an opportunity without saying again, thank you to the parks group, uh, especially Tony Reese and Emily and all the guys uh, who did a great job on maintaining that park through all that heavy traffic. It's really awesome out there. So hope to see you all out there. And this brings us to the end of our agenda session. Michael, anything? Okay. Then we are adjourned. Thank you, staff.